the experience of living in a divided society uh, where there is enormous distrust is a very painful and difficult thing to live with, I think. And the, um, and the situation in Cyprus, of course, it's, you know, there's not a military dictatorship, but there are people who are anxious and fear for what um, the future might hold. Um, there are people who have profound levels of distrust about people on the other side of the wall. There are people who have profound levels of distrust about politicians that they hear who speak from the other end. And, um, and all too often, words can get um, profoundly twisted. I'll just give you one tiny example. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke about um, how I'd like to see a Cyprus that didn't need to have troops on it. And... Um, when this was then reported in some parts of the media, the word Turkish was inserted. I hadn't said that, but that was the way that somebody had decided to interpret it. And I'll make it very clear. I have a, a passionate um, hope that it's going to be possible to have a united island. It's, it's a shock, it's a scandal, it's a tragedy that within the European Union we have a divided capital city, that we have a divided island. Um, and I have a dream that one day there will be free um, traffic between the north and the south because there won't be any um, barriers. There won't be soldiers pointing sticks at each other and hurling abuse at each other and taking photographs of each other to see whether they've stood for 15 minutes in a row or only 9 minutes in a row in a particular spot. Um, that all those beautiful villas that lie in the, in the green, um, in the buffer zone. Uh, will be inhabited and will be, I don't know, villas for people or maybe beautiful hotels that people could stay in and um, bringing, you know, important euros or dollars or pounds to the island. I have a dream that there, that there will be free trade with the north and with the south, between the north and the south, between the UK and the north, between the UK and the south, between Turkey and the south, between Turkey and the north. Um, I have a dream that people will have all the property um, issues resolved for them, um, whether that means by compensation or by restoration or whatever it means. I, uh, I, I have a dream that um, the territorial disputes will be resolved and that people will be able to um, uh, live in an island absolutely <coughs> confident in their own safety and their security. Um, but of course, you're all, I can see your faces going, well, but this is a hopeless dream. How can that ever come to pass? because the level of distrust is so intense. Uh, when I was at university, I directed a play uh, <coughs> with, um, uh, called Othello uh, by Shakespeare, which, of course, a large part of it is set in, in, uh, in Cyprus. Uh, I think the Venetians were the problem at the time. Um, but, the, but, of course, what, is, what, what that play is about is trust, or how easy it is to make people distrust um, and there's this line at the end, Othello, um, who has been made so jealous by Iago that he kills uh, his lovely wife, uh, Desdemona, uh, says of himself that he is a man not easily jealous, but being wrought, <coughs> perplexed in the extreme. And again, that's somehow what it feels like in Cyprus. Um, genuine, everybody I've met from both, both communities, um, not easily jealous, but being wrought, perplexed in the extreme. And so, how are we going to change this? Well, first and foremost, of course, we've got to have the, the whole of the international community supporting a resolution. That means not just the UK and the European Union and the United Nations, it also means Greece and Turkey. I believe that we have that at the moment. I think both Greece and Turkey have governments that want a resolution of the situation on the island. I've spoken to my counterparts in, in both Athens and in Ankara, well actually they're talking in Istanbul but um, he's my counterpart in Ankara as it were, um, and I know that they both want to see a resolution. Similarly, um, you've got to have leaders in both communities that not only want to do business with one another, <coughs> but can do business with, another, with one another, and I think at the moment we do have that. You certainly have two people, two leaders, who have staked their political careers on wanting to achieve a, a lasting settlement for the island. But the other thing you need, I think, is you need two 
communities of people who are prepared to do a little bit of letting go. I apologise to those of you who have heard me say this before, but in Indonesia, the way that you catch a monkey is you, you um, empty out a gourd, a hard gourd, and you put some uh, honey, uh, or some, uh, some nuts rather, inside, and um, you make the hole just large enough for a monkey to put their hand in like that. But when they grab hold of the nut, they can't get free because they've formed a fist which won't fit through the hole. And so then the only way that they can get free is by letting go of the nut. And I think that what, one of the things that we desperately need is two communities that not only see that they want a resolution, but actively are prepared to campaign for a resolution, or want a resolution, and are prepared to do the business of letting go. Letting go sometimes of historical positions, sometimes letting go of preferred options, sometimes being prepared to say, yes, concession is better than just continuing with the status quo forever and a day. And I, I really pay tribute to all those people on the island over the years and now who have been prepared to make um, concessions. Now, I know um, there's a... Uh, there's a story about Mrs. Thatcher. I'm not particularly a Mrs. Thatcher fan. Um, you'll be surprised to hear. But uh, not least because of what the Conservative Party did to the valleys of South Wales, where I represent, and to the mines. But um, I, I, one of the things that I think that she profoundly got wrong was that she said that compromise is wishy-washy. But actually, compromise is the greatest human achievement. It's easy to have passionate feelings about something, but it's far more difficult to make compromise. And uh, again, referring to my Spanish, in Spanish, unlike in Mrs. Thatcher's vocabulary, there's only one word for two concepts, for compromise and for commitment. It's the single word, compromiso. And so what I desperately hope for in Cyprus is for compromiso. In other words, a commitment to compromise. Now I hope that in these next few days and weeks um, we will achieve something quite dramatic on the island. We're, as I'm sure all of you know, the UK stands ready to do anything that will help achieve a, a, a settlement, a, an outcome. Every year that goes by, the difficulties are likely to increase, I think, whether that's because of legal challenges um, or because of entrenched positions becoming more entrenched or because of changes of leadership um, in either of the communities. But all I'd say is that I pay tribute to those who are prepared to make compromise, uh, even if it means making themselves unpopular. And I pay tribute to the leaders who are prepared to make those compromises and stand by those compromises, because I think in the end that's the only way we can achieve what I hope everybody wants, which is a united island, uh, by zonal, by communal federation, uh, where everybody can live in peace, where everybody can achieve prosperity, where the ports are open, where there's free trade, um, and where the whole of the island uh, can be fully integrated within the European Union. I haven't got anything else of dramatic significance to say. We're not voting on it. Was that the end? Not the end. Oh, that's the end. Um, so, um, but I'm very happy to take any questions that people